welcome back Missy. Uh, Lindsay is up next and his submission's number 26 and Lindsay you're familiar with the process the bell will ding at nine minutes indicating that you need to wrap, wrap up quorum's three anyway mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> thank you uh, Councillor O'Leary and um, thank you uh, Council for this opportunity to speak to my submission um, on the proposed Hamilton Housing Accord policy and its special housing areas. Um, I, was, I was clear to, I wanted to make it clear that this is a personal submission, I didn't have time to run it past my own trust, but I am reasonably confident that um, most, if not all, of the trustees of the DV Bryant Trust um, would be in support of what I'm saying. When I wrote a paper for our board um, last year about um, our interest in our historic interest in housing, it went to two and a half pages, um, and I just recall. Um, the Bryant Village for the Elderly out in um, St Andrews and uh, Bryant Hall and numerous other um, initiatives over the years that have indicated that we've had a concern um, about housing that goes back a long way uh, in the 90 plus years of the history of Bryant philanthropy. Um, look, I want to congratulate the planning staff uh, and, honor, and others who have developed this policy, uh, the work they've done uh, talking with other councils and the work they have done liaising with stakeholders. I know um, Luke O'Dwyer came to uh, one of our community funders meeting and spoke with us about some of the intentions behind uh, the policy. Um, and I, so I see it as a start. And I want to congratulate them on that. I think uh, trying to use some planning levers to encourage a greater supply um, of affordable housing um, has got to be commended. I'm not a developer, so I, I, I can't talk, and I'm, but I'm sure you've had others that have talked to you about um, the economics of um, what's proposed in terms of a minimum of 10 housing units in any SHA, and then the fact that um, under the proposal, 20% uh, of those have to be of a size that hopefully then will make those more affordable. Look, it's, it's a good start, but I have to say that's all it is. And, and I, if I'm really honest, I'll, I was a keynote spa speaker at the Community Waikato Conference yesterday, and I did describe it as underwhelming. So I've got to be honest and say um, that's where I'm coming from, that I think, Council, there's so much more we could and should be doing. And what I want to say to you is that I'm not expecting you to do it on your own. I'd like to think I'm a reasonable person, and I'd like to think I realise that there's incredible pressures on council budget. I read the Waikato Times. I know about some of the holes you're in. I know some of the challenges with some of the physical infrastructure that you have. But I'm equally concerned. Uh, I went to um, hear Kelvin Eglinton, your growth manager, talk about you know, the exciting things that are ahead, the cusp that Hel um, Hamilton's on in terms of growth, and that is all good. But my argument and point would be that if we don't maintain the social infrastructure, then people aren't going to be so excited about living in Kirikiriroa. So I think that we need to do better than just this. Uh, we need to work on a plan. And I, th I hope you will have seen um, in my submission that I appended, uh, if you haven't already seen it, the report of the Mayor's Housing Task Force um, from Wellington. And I have to say, I think this is an impressive document. It's a document that's got vision, and their vision is unashamedly that all Wellingtonians will be housed. But more than a vision, it's actually got some substance in terms of strategy and then policy. And I would like to suggest to Council that you convene a meeting of interested parties that together 
we create this vision, this plan, and then we try and do some things together because we need to. From what I understand, Hamilton has the second highest number of people living in motels at the moment uh, in this country, um, paid for, as you know, by the taxpayer, the Ministry of Social Development, and that <clears throat> my, my friend Peter Humphreys, the manager of our Hamilton Christian Night Shelter, said that as of the 31st of March this year, there were 219 people on the emergency pri uh, priority waiting list uh, for the Ministry of Social Development in terms of housing. Clearly, there are needs in our communities, and we need, I think, to be more ambitious than just playing with some planning levers. With the greatest respect to Luke and the others in the, in the, in the, plan, in the planning um, unit, I think um, we can and we must do better. So I'm asking or inviting council to convene a meeting. I think one of the really exciting things about the mayoral task force in Hamilton, uh, in, in Wellington, sorry, was that it was convened by the deputy mayor and it brought together people as um, people like Ian Castles, the property developer, and Stephanie McIntyre from the downtown community ministry. People that had a, an interest in the issue, had proven experience and knowledge, and they came together, and it sounds like over a matter of only about four meetings, uh, they put together, uh, obviously there was some, some pretty impressive work done in the background, uh, this, this document. And um, I would like to challenge the council that we do something similar, that, um, that you convene um, a meeting of interested parties, and I'm suggesting so it's local government, that it's central government representatives, that it's um, developers, that it's community people in our um, social housing provider network in Hamilton, uh, the likes of Habitat for Humanity, um, the WISE group, uh, there's a number of the, the, the Runanga and others, and with philanthropy, because we've talked about this, and we've said that we realise that grants aren't going to cut it, and that we are prepared to leverage our balance sheets to try and do something. So I would like to encourage you, challenge you, to invite us all into the tent where we can talk together and develop a plan. Because I think it's not enough just to say the problem's too big and, it lo and it, the responsibility lies somewhere else, but let's together try and work on some achievable um, solutions. And I think it's going to require a number of different solutions. As um, this Wellington report says, housing is a complex issue and there will be more than one solution needed. We need to be pulling on every lever and be brave enough to try new things. When I was um, at the opening of the Meteor the other Friday morning, and I was talking with Mayor Andrew, and I said that, look, you know, this, this, is, this was a wonderful partnership between central government, local government, and in that case, the One Victoria Trust. And things happened. I'm, con I'm very aware that um, the council are looking to work with Momentum Waikato Community Foundation and the whole network of funders that sit behind them on the Waikato Regional Theatre. Some, a couple of great examples of collaboration, where collaboration can make a difference and that we can do some things. So please do think very seriously about my invitation, um, my challenge, to invite us, those that are of us who are passionate about this issue, and I'm really grateful that I work for a trust that is not just interested in making grants and doing charity, but it is actually interested in doing social justice, making a difference. 
And so they are talking about and freeing up my time to enable me to make a contribution like this. So I would like to join you and others and others that I know in our sector who are keen to work with you to create something bigger and bolder that we can actually um, do something. I think in my submission I said even if you put in just some of the money that's coming to you from the sale of the pensioner housing, we could leverage off that. Okay. And <coughs> Time is up, and Thank I've got you. a list of questions. Thanks, Lindsay. So, Councillor Henry, you're up first. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much, Lindsay, for your passionate um, uh, talk. Look, uh, just a couple of uh, small mm. questions, but um, do you feel that we actually, as a council, we do too much on our own, instead of inviting uh, other groups in to, to work with us? Is that... I, I, uh, I think perhaps sometimes you do, and okay. I think sometimes there's an assumption that you see other people will do it. Oh, well, council will do it, yes. or that central government will do it. Yeah. And what I'm trying to say is, I think some of us realise you can't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. But some of us are very willing to work with you. Mm. Yeah, and the other question, thank you, that's great. The other question is also, I mean, do you, do you also, we had another submitter earlier on saying, it seems like we try to reinvent the wheel while other councils have already done something yeah. and we are trying to do our own so we can say we have done it. But yeah. really, have you got that feeling too a little bit because yeah. you come with the Wellington model? Absolutely. And look, not just the Wellington model. I'm, I'm a bit yeah. familiar with some of the things that have been done in Christchurch. Right. And the Christchurch City Council, you know, has was um, the second largest property um, housing um, owner in the country behind Housing New Zealand Corporation until they transferred their social housing to an independent um, charitable company um, so that that company could get some of the income related rent subsidies to make the social housing sustainable. You're right, I think we can learn from other places, Siggy. Um, if I can be so bold, uh, Councillor Henry, um, that you know that we we can we can learn from other places. You're right. We don't have to reinvent the world, uh, the, the the wheel. I um, I hope to be showing to our trust this afternoon at our board meeting, um, a couple of videos from the United States of some really exciting, inventive models of social housing. Um, again, there's lots of lots of jurisdictions that are struggling and challenged by these same issues. We can learn from them. No? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor uh, Mallet. Thanks, Lindsay, um, for your presentation and all the work you do behind the scenes for the community. Thank you. Um, despite your um, accurate um, presentation that there's a lot of things we can, that, that we can do, Council has a certain jurisdiction, yes, and and we are talking today about the special housing accords. Yes, yes. So, what are your specific? Uh, do you? Uh, what are your specific comments on that? <coughs> my, which which is aligned to our district plan? Et yeah, yeah, sure. I, I mean, my comments are that I think. Um, well, as I, as I said, I think that probably wiser heads that are involved, like developers and others, will tell you, and I'm sure they probably have, about you know, the economics yep. Yep. Of, of whether what's proposed under the SHAs is doable for them. Because there's, it's got to work for them, doesn't it? Mm. As well as um, for council, central government, uh, and for the people that hopefully will benefit from the affordable the home, ha yeah. houses. Look, I mean, I... When I read the policy, I thought there were some really good, you know, there were some good things in it. I think some of the, the criteria are clear. Um, you know, I think uh, people know what they would be letting themselves in for. Um, but, you know, whether, whether 10 is, is too small for some developers, I, you know, I, I can't really comment on that. But I, 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 you know, I like the idea of 20% of them having to be of a size that hopefully will encourage affordable housing because they'll be cheaper because they're on smaller sections and smaller dwellings. 
Okay. So I guess my point is that um, you, you're, you're, dead, you're dead right that um, there are some things that we, we can do and we mm. have the power to do and we're mm. legislatively required mm. to do, yep. da -da -da, and there's things we can help and set up conversations, yeah. da -da -da, yeah. Yeah. but today we're doing that. But, yeah, yeah. So that, that was the bit I was trying to get some yeah, feedback yeah. from. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and as I say, you know, you, I think it's a good start. Lever, right, hopefully it, it, it helps the other things Abs too. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and, okay. and as I say, yeah. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor. Um, Councillor Southgate. Thank you, Madam Chair. D um, just a couple of short questions. Um, um, your preference is quite clear that you'd like us just to step back a bit and do a, um, um, you know, get a, a group together to design something that's fit for purpose, similar to the Wellington model, right? That's your pre number one pre preference. Similar, well, but fit for purpose for Hamilton. Yes, um, that's right, exactly. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't want to prejudge things. I, I think we've got to look at what's required here and then think about what will work best. Okay, and I noticed in the stuff that you did send from Wellington on page 92 of that, of that, mm -hmm. the vision and goals, the vision and goals that mm. was set out on page 92, mm -hmm. um, that um, do you, given that maybe, maybe council won't decide to support that group, but they'll try and pick up some of the better things that are going on, mm, mm. Um, would you like to see those visions and goals uh, captured in our policy? Ideally, yes. Ideally, and thank you. And um, the other area that you, you've picked up on a few times is um, about identifying, working closer with the incentives and barriers. Do you feel that we mm. need to pay more attention to that in our policy? Is that yes, what yes. Okay, so you've already said that you support the smaller homes on smaller lots, but yes. that you're not an expert in terms of actual size. But the intention is to make sure yeah. that the outcome of smaller, more affordable houses is in the mix, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. And one of the ways that you feel we might make progress there is if we sat down and had a meaningful conversation with MSD or the community housing sector. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And the other thing you talked about, or the Wellington thing talks about quite a, quite a lot, is um, design review and um, urban designing, urban planning, and quality houses. Yes. So you think it could be useful to council to take a step back and ha um, get some input from some urban design specialists in respect to these things? I think so. Um, and I know there are a number of architects around the country that are working really hard on sus good, sustainable um, social housing models in terms of building. And I, this is where I think we've got to be a little bit open to, to learning from best practice in other places. Okay, thank you. So, so yeah, no, so I've understood if we don't get to the point where we step back and do this, this mm. approach, we need to pick up those key points in landing. Okay, thank, I, thank, thank you, you Councillor. Um, Councillor Bunting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, G'day, Lindsay. Thanks Hi, for Mark. Your presentation. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the Wellington model, which I, I thought mm. was, it was kind of cool, and boy, they got that turned around fast, didn't they? Mm. Um, if we were to plop ourselves over that, uh, and I'm looking at page 94, mm -hmm. the uh, little box models there, mm. where, in your opinion, do you reckon Hamilton sits in the greatest area of need? You've got emergency housing, social housing, affordable housing, existing housing stock, and new housing supply. Yes. Yeah. So they've obviously put a lot of emphasis yeah. on the affordable housing. Yeah, right? yeah they have, because that's their need. Where do you think yeah. we sit? Well, I, I, th I mean, I think um, it's, there's an argument that there's quite a need, Mark, across a num most of those mm. parts of the continuum. I mean, I know through my work on the Hamilton Christian Night Shelter that one of the reasons why we're, we're full at the moment most nights is that the guys, and this is talking about the men's shelter mainly, mm -hmm. that the, the guys have got nowhere to go from the shelter. Mm -hmm. There's just lit, there's very little emergency or social housing available. <laughs> so they're staying in our shelter longer. And whilst it was only really intended to be, you know, a, a stopping off point, where people caught their breath and, um, but we're, you know, we're finding that the guys are staying longer because there's just nothing there for them. So how many guys are you talking about? There are, um, we've got a capacity for 27 in, right. the, in, the, in the night shelter. Um, five of, well, yeah, so five of them were supposed to be more long-term and the 22 were the emergency, but right. it's basically turning around the other way. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, 20, 20 to 25, um, no, yeah, we, we're, we're full up. Right. Yeah. 
is where he is. So yeah, yeah. So we need. So it's it is. It's the social housing, right? Um, but it's also the affordable housing that that I'm hearing from um, a lot of. Uh, what, what I call middle New Zealand, you know, a key working, the working poor mm. who, who cannot afford to get a foot on the ladder. You know, they are, they are my, well, no, my children are, are lucky. They're privileged like I am. Um, but, you know, a lot of them on low wages ca cannot get a foot into the market. They cannot, a lot of them can't afford rentals, mm. let alone some sort of you know rent to buy or some sort of option like that so in short answer i think we need something across the whole continuum but i would be um, particularly focused on emergency social and affordable all right thanks lindsay that's great mm. thanks all right thank you very much lindsay that's the questions and we're bang on time so thank you good to see you again thank Twice you angela yes absolutely yes <laughs> and, and and thank you again for um monday um afternoon i know doug was really chuffed good. yeah thank yeah. you very much right thanks and, and and if i can just leave you with three swahili words um that i learnt climbing kilimanjaro <laughs> um pumoja tunawesa pumoja tunawesa together we can nice Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Cheers. Thank you. Right, our next submission committee members is number 47, and we have Ian Johnson and Scott Nelson representing Fonterra Limited. So welcome, gentlemen. Um, you have got 10 minutes, and the bell will ding at nine, indicating there's one minute remaining. So when you're ready. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Scott Nelson. Thank you very much for uh, hosting me and uh, myself and Ian here today. So it was, it was great to see some of you two weeks ago. Um, and it's, it's great to be able to present on Fonterra's submission around the draft special housing area policy for Hamilton City. Um, so overall, whoops, okay, so, uh, so hopefully you heard that. Um, so overall, Fonterra supports the development of a policy that will, uh, will guide SHAs in both appropriate areas um, and locations, and away from inappropriate ones, including heavy industrial areas such as Fonterra Tarapa. Uh, so I've got um, Ian Johnson here today um, from Mitchell Dash, who's going to help us uh, with our submission. Um, but firstly, I'd like to take a, a little opportunity to tell you a little bit more about us uh, and my, my team at Tarapa, what we do, and our perspective on the policy. Okay, so, um, so on the screen, uh, so I'm not sure if you can see this, but on the screen, not yet. Uh, not yet. Yeah, don't mind. That's it. Okay. Okay. So. Um, okay. We can see here on our little monitors, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll continue. So um, what what you can see on the screens uh, shortly will be uh, in the blue. So you can see uh, the the property holdings of Fonterra Tarapa. Uh, including the manufacturing site uh, and associated farm. Uh, so the the red uh, line indicates our our respective boundaries, and just to you know provide a bit of context, the blue line is the the Tiawa cycleway that we were involved in uh, that that uh, goes along the side of the river, and uh, the yellow line indicates State Highway One. So when we um, yeah, when we were you know, building this site back in 1967, so you know, 50 years ago uh, this year, um, you know, it was quite a different, um, quite a different operation. You know, we were we were uh, um, geographically separated from the city, uh, so much so that we had to have our own village on site to you know, for our teams to um, to not only build but then operate our site. So the green line extends uh, shows the extent of the existing urban development in Hamilton. Um, and you can see that's you know that's moved considerably closer to our uh, our holdings as we've gone through. So there's a slide further on in the pack that that gives you these exact details, but I want to talk to this picture. Uh, so this this is my site. This is uh, Fonterra Tarapa. Um, it's about home to about 900 employees uh, associated with with Tarapa, its operation, and those associated with Contact Energy, which provides the steam. So um, in our peak operation, we'll process about 800 million, oh, sorry, about 8 million litres of, of milk and cream uh, into food that goes all around the world. So we're producing food every day um, that goes into about 100 different markets. And those, those foods include milk powders, cheese, cream cheese, butter, and fats. 
So it's difficult to put an exact number on the contribution that my site uh, and our team contribute to the to the local city. Um, but when you take into the, the broader region, you know, um, Fonterra in itself contributes um, a little bit over $2 billion worth of, of benefits into the local community. So, you know, we're a significant contributor into, uh, into local operations. So, you know, uh, we were, we were, it was awesome to host the, the mayor and, and councillors uh, through Tarapa two weeks ago. We were, able, we were able to and excited to show the $20 million of investment that we've currently got underway and, and is being commissioned today, actually. And, you know, we've, you know, part of why we're able to do that is because of, you know, the, the zoning of the land that we have, uh, the security of our location um, and that, that heavy industrial zone land. So there's a couple of key points that I want to, um, to, to talk to the council today about that. So, you know, Tarapa doesn't operate in isolation. So, you know, we, we receive um, raw ingredients, so milk and cream and, and other ingredients from uh, around the region, which heavily, um, you know, relies on the wider regional infrastructure, uh, including, you know, rail and, uh, and our roading networks. And, you know, we, our connection through Interstate Highway is really important in that. We rely on that, um, that safe and strategic road access for um, the other key elements, such as uh, Crawford Street, uh, which is our predominant export hub uh, for, for the site, but also for, for other Waikato sites. And, you know, the, the location of the site and the remote location of the site was purposeful. So, you know, that heavy industrially zoned land, um, the lack of sensitive activities nearby, which has obviously changed over time, um, the proximity to, you know, to the thousand farmer shareholders that provide milk to, uh, to my team every day um, has allowed us to, you know, to strategically invest. Um, it's allowed us to recruit and, and pull in uh, our highly skilled work workforce and, you know, we're really proud of the team that, that works at Tarapa. Um, but it ultimately will allow us to continue to invest, um, you know, further in terms of other developments. Uh, so I'd like to... Uh, hand over to Ian um, to talk through next piece. Okay, so it's a little bit of a good, good guy, bad guy routine here. You've heard all the good stuff about the site. <laughs> okay, we look uh, forward now to Here's some of the things that we'd like to see <laughs> changed in the policy. Uh, but the, the first thing is to make it clear that you know, we, we are supportive of the, there being a policy. Um, and partly the reason for that is uh, when, when we're looking at the issue of affordable housing, we're a little unclear um, because we're not housing market specialists, we're not developers, we're not economists, what the nature of the issue is and where the affordability crisis actually sits at the moment. Uh, so therefore we're a little uncertain about what particular areas might do to alleviate that problem. But in terms of land supply as being the solution to it, um, clearly there's a substantial amount of land around the city already in terms of its potential for housing. And just looking at the slide at the moment, you've got the, the grey area there, which is the existing built-up area. Um, that's already subject to provisions within the district plan that, to my knowledge, seem to be working pretty well and effectively. They allow development to go down to 150 square metres for apartments. They allow development down to 200 square metres for duplex. They allow townhouses. They allow all sorts of development, any, any particular size, any particular location within the residential areas. And it seems to me that the market's responding really positively to that. It's delivering good numbers, and the numbers that are in your housing accord seem to be pretty well on track already to be delivered through what your plan is already making provision for. Um, so looking further afield, um, other areas that might well come on stream, um, the boundary alterations in the late 80s were specifically designed to bring in additional land for long-term land banking. Rotokauri, uh, Rotatuna, Peacock's area. Um, those areas, uh, sorry, Rotatuna is now largely built out to the extent that it was brought in. Rotokauri is just beginning to get off the mark. Uh, things are beginning to happen there. Um, Peacocks hasn't been, it's been held back largely because of infrastructure, but hopefully the decision around the housing in, in infrastructure fund will help to really bring that onto the market. And we can see there's going to be significant potential there. So all in all, there there's doesn't seem to be any particular shortage of land available there at all. And of course, since those 1989 boundary changes, there's been the further one down the eastern side of the city that's brought in additional land at Rokura. So in terms of land supply and what the plan can develop, 
uh, under the plan provisions, there's significant opportunity. And sitting at the top of the city then, we've got Tarapa North Industrial Node. And it won't be any surprise uh, from the material that you just heard presented by Scott to know that that area has, has been identified as a strategic industrial node through every layer of planning of the planning framework um, under, underpinning its regional significance. Um, so it's not an area that needs to be taken lightly. And our concern, I guess, really is that without amendment to the policy, um, a, a more open mind, open aspect approach to the uh, development of special housing areas might see this as being a prime area to develop special housing areas. And you've heard submissions already today. My proponents wanted to look at particularly at that area. Our, our case really is that given the extent of op opportunities elsewhere in the city, uh, given the nature of those sites and the way that the market is operated within those areas and within the, the, the city generally, uh, that there's no need to go to Tarapa North. So in our view, the policy needs clarifying. Uh, it needs to provide a bit more clarity behind it to identify those areas that are appropriate. And we've indicated that those are the areas that are best served by community facilities and, there are, and to identify areas that are inappropriate. And it would be no surprise to hear from us that we think the Tarapa North location, specifically in the vicinity of the Tarapa manufacturing site, is an inappropriate location. So that, that the nature of the amendments that we're seeking specifically to the policy. Um, we've suggested that um, in addition to the locational matters, that there are technical matters that require assessment through the consideration of any areas, and that should also include traffic matters, because obviously the traffic generation that's needed uh, to support spe uh, special housing areas will have a bearing on the network, and that network has been specifically developed and managed to support strategic industrial nodes. <coughs> So okay. that's, that's, that's Thank a 100 mile an hour dash through our summary. Uh, uh, <laughs> happy Claire, to take questions. Do we have um, that printout? You do. Of them? Just, I'd like a copy if you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so well, that's okay. We'll go to questions, Councillor Southgate. No, it'll go when you. Yeah. Thank you. I touched it. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Um, you might not be surprised about this question because we've crossed paths many times on this before in respect to future proof, right? So my question is going to relate to, do you believe that the policy as drafted, I know you want, you've got some amendments and you're putting in an additional amendment around transport, I understand that, but in terms of um, reverse sensitivity, boundaries, air discharges and those kinds of things that were taken into consideration in defining industrial land in future proof, is this consistent to, I think you seem to be suggesting it might not be as consistent as it should be? It's not as clear as it could be. It's not as and clear as yeah, it could be. And we're, we're thinking here that um, the wording in the policy talks about being consistent with regional policy and with the policy you know, strategic planning framework that's in the district plan. And that's great, but someone reading that policy will then know what that means without then investigating all the background documents behind it. So where there's an opportunity to clarify the policy to make certain things as clear as they possibly can in terms of those areas that are favourable and those that are inappropriate, mm. the opportunity should be taken. So you wouldn't, you're not opposing all industrial land being subject to some review? It's a, on case, no, uh, horses not at all. Yeah, yeah, on yeah, case by yeah. case. I mean, I mean, the reality is that a lot of the industrial zoned land is legacy industrial land. It's, it's zoned that because that's the way it's always been. Mm. And, and the district plan didn't set out to promote transformational change in every area. It chose certain areas. It chose the central city primarily. Mm. And the evidence is that it's working really well in turning things around in the central city. Mm. It hasn't tackled industrial land boundaries and those legacy areas. And the SHAs perhaps have a role in looking at some of the fringe areas of the industrial areas where there may be opportunity to redefine the boundaries. Yeah, so that would be done on a case-by-case -case basis uh, yep, and, and yep. should be consistent with those hierarchy documents such as future pro proof strategy and, and I, regional policy. And I think things. many of those will find a more comfortable route through that framework because of where they're located in relation to other things that are within the city already. Okay. Um, and just final question. if So, so related to that, if um, new areas that are existing in business land or industrial land at the moment had proper boundary considerations and could demonstrate that they can mitigate against all the reverse sensitivity effects or other effects, 
and you're not totally opposed to it, you're just saying that it, at this point in time you're not confident that that could be achieved close to Fonterra Terrapa. That's right. Fonterra Terrapa and the Terrapa North Industrial Node has been specifically identified for a future purpose, it to be a strategically important for the future of the regional economy. A lot of the industrial zone that already exists within the rest of the city, which hasn't been so identified, is because it's legacy areas, and it may be more appropriate now to look at different land use for it. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got four minutes left, um, so just one question, if you will, Councillor Mallet. Thank you. Thank you, and Paula did a good summary of it. Um, just to be very clear, your concern is that if there's housing close to you guys, um, additional traffic, reserve, reverse sensitivity in terms of no, they could complain about the noise coming from Fonterra, those are your concerns, aren't they? Are those the, just, so just specifically, what are your concerns? Yeah, look, the, the reverse sensitivity one is, is one of our key concerns. Yep. Um, we do everything we can to mitigate our impacts. Yep. Um, but we, you know, we are a large 24-7 processing operation and it's impossible to, to mitigate the visual aspects of that. So you know, um, we do our best to, to mitigate them. So that, that's our, our primary concern. Um, like we say, we, we support the, the formation of a policy. Um, we just believe that the Tarapa North Industrial Area is, is inappropriate is for, inappropriate for, for residential. Mm -hmm. okay. I think to, to add to that, um, you know, there are quite a number of things that might have effects over a 24 hour period. Yeah. The odd banging and clanking of, say, the stuff on the road network or the rail network. Yeah. But the difference here is it, it's not like an airport where the noise is when the air, aircraft come in and when they go out. This is 24 7 noise, which is continuous for 24 7. So the, the whole environment around this factory is a permanent set of effects that spill beyond the boundary. You won't see a night sky above Tarapa because the, the site itself has a lights. pool of light mm -hmm. lighting it as if it was daytime. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks for the coconut ice. <laughs> yeah, I'll pleasure. you. Yeah. Councillor Millett. Right. Sorry, you haven't got any. Thank, thank, thank <laughs> you. How did you get something we didn't, Councillor Millett? No idea. <laughs> and, and I queried how that came from a dairy. Uh, I said, what's the dairy input into this coconut oh, ice? Right. <laughs> we, we can, um, and you return visit, we can help you with that. Councillor, that was, that was, Councillor that was an out and out <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, uh, oh, darn, I've got two very quick. Go. Uh, I'll go fast. <laughs> um, first, I was really interested in your slide where you want uh, new, all new residential dwellings to be built within 1K of an existing school. Is that realistic? Well, uh, I put that in there following a, a very quick analysis of the district plan maps, uh, looking at the existing city area yep. and where residential development is. Do any measurement from any part of the residential area, you'll pick up those things. Okay. And, and what we create, what you hope to be able to create through special housing area, are new housing areas that will be just as inviting, enduring, long-lasting, and desirable into the future as the rest of the city. So that's within one k of a school, not a school zone. So school. Within school. Okay. Um, and. Uh, finally, and thanks for your indulgence, Madam Chair. Just the um, if it was written into uh, contracts when one bought a house, if there was a northern area that you know what you're going to move into, I'm trying to think of the Western Springs example, you know, with the speedway, etc. Would that satisfy you, or uh, no? I, I would I would say not, right. um, because the the zoning goes with, or the, you know, the consent goes with the land, not with the person that's on that piece of land at any one point in time. I see. Uh, people's attitudes change, and I would suggest that it will be a problem that might well come back to bite council as well, because the first people that people turn to when they're not satisfied with the situation is that they'll turn to council. Yeah, I see. All right. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, Councillor McPherson. Thanks, and welcome back, Martin, to this table. <laughs> <laughs> um, just... Uh, Thinking about that, uh, the possibility of a residential area in the Tarapa North area, when I looked at the map of that area recently, it showed a buffer zone around the Fonterra factory for purposes, I guess, of noise, visual pollution, reverse sensitivity issues, mm -hmm. and that buffer zone didn't quite reach Hutchins Hutchinson's Road, did it? So uh, that's what's contained in the district plan. Right, within the, the district plan itself, it, it zones all of Tarapa North has been an industrial zone. Yes, no, I'm, not ta I'm talking about the, the line that's drawn, as a, which is a bit oh, sorry, of a yeah, line. It's got a noise control boundary. Noise control, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a boundary that um, is, is there that Fonterra has to operate to achieve yeah. a noise standard at that boundary. Yeah. Yeah. It's not to say that the effects yeah. of the factory won't be felt or heard beyond there, yeah. but that's a limit of 
There's uh, also a large sort of shelter belt of trees there, isn't there, between uh, on the north side of Fonterra? Uh, there's it's not more than one. There's trees within the site that I think, think are part of the There are trees, site, yeah. and certainly it is it's very visible. The factory is very visible from Hutchinson Road. You can, you can see all the way through the site. So um, there has been some trees there in the past. There are some trees there, but um, yeah. from there you can clearly see the factory. And uh, you talked about the provision of industrial land. Um, even though it's outside the city, it's within stone's throw. There's a the Horatu industrial area itself, which is there's discussion underway at the moment with Waikato District for that to expand, isn't there? Uh, yeah, that, that, it, that itself is a strategic industrial node. Um, it was identified under the same sort of process that resulted in Tarapa North being so identified, but Tarapa North was specifically identified because of the, pro the, the existing activity within it and the potential to develop additional dairy-related industries around it. So the land that Fonterra owns at Tarapa Farm on the opposite side of what was the State Highway um, is within the same zoning. It's been held, it was originally purchased as a buffer, but it's now been held with the purposes of developing further dairy-related industry. And the land that Perry's owns was used primarily as a sand mining operation with a bit of farming, wasn't That's it? correct, yeah. yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming uh, with your submission today. It's been very helpful. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillors, my computer is dying on me, and I, I'm about to throw it on the floor. But I think, uh, Carleen, are you? See, now I don't know who's actually here or not. Um, do you have the list clear? Uh, it's just not, it's not playing. So we've just had Fonterra, so who was, there was someone that had arrived? Well. Carlene. Yeah, is it not, I said Carlene, is that you? Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Okay, Sarah, come, sorry, I should have said Well Networks as well, because people, people change. Um, welcome, Sarah. Now, councillors, this is submission number 51, and again, it's 10 minutes, so Sarah, the bell will ding at one, indicating you need to wrap up. Okay. I have a copy of... Um... Yep, we'll get that handed out. Thanks. Okay, so when you're ready. Oh, I can't go. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks. So my name is Sarah Brown and I'm an environmental planner for Well Networks. I've worked as a planner for 10 years in the electricity distribution sector and as a consultant. So Well Networks is an electricity distributor operating under the Electricity Act 1992, which owns and operates and develops electricity distribution infrastructure within the Waikato region to provide line function services to over 80,000 customer connections. This includes the distribution of electricity to all residents and businesses within Hamilton City. Well, as a network utility operator, is a network utility operator under the Resource Management Act and has a responsibility of providing a secure and efficient supply of electricity to the community within Wales Network distribution area. Wales Network of Cables and Lines allows every household, business, school, medical facility and other types of consumer to have access to electricity. Well is generally supportive of the approach and overall content, content of the draft special housing, housing policy area. Sorry, the draft special housing policy area will ensure a greater supply of affordable housing within Hamilton, while ensuring that adequate provision and supply of infrastructure is not compromised by such development. However, Well requests that an amendment is required to ensure that the developer completes all obligations related to electricity reticulation of a subdivision complete, completed, completed under this policy. Well supports Schedule 1 is included in the draft Hamilton Special Housing Areas Policy and set out in the table which is included in my submission and in the, this report that I have here. The infrastructure requirements provided for in Schedule 1 require the developer to actively engage well, who will then determine if the development can be serviced with electricity. Well can then determine the type of infrastructure required for the development 
in any legal arrangements that need to be completed, such as easements or council negotiations for network utility equipment within the road reserve. This requirement is of particular importance as development becomes concentrated and less space is available for network utility infrastructure underground and above ground, such as transformers and pillar boxes within council administered road reserve. With larger infill developments, well may need to secure space within the road reserve to locate network utility equipment to supply the development. In these instances, it is necessary that council and well work collaboratively to create a balance between streetscape amenity and the requirement for infrastructure. Furthermore, early engagement will enable well to plan for network upgrades where development is likely to become concentrated. So the amendment sought by WELL. So WELL requests an amendment to Schedule 3 of the draft Hamilton Special Housing Policy Area, which will require that clearance is required for non-council infrastructure providers by way of a condition under, this, under the subdivision under this policy. And such clearance must accom accompany an application for 224C and this would be consistent with the current process for subdivision. So the reasoning for this request is to ensure that the developer fulfills their responsibilities in relation to electricity reticulation to new dwellings or lots such as easements. So to conclude, WOW generally supports the draft Ham Hamilton Special Housing Areas Policy, subject to an amendment recommended by WOW Overall, the draft Hamilton Special Housing Areas Policy, subject to the amendment, will ensure that the adequate provision and supply of infrastructure is not compromised by development. Thank you. Great, thank you. And there's a question from Councillor McPherson. Yeah, thanks. Just with this collaboration that you're talking about between the Council and WELL and the, the your wish, if I'm really right, to for WELL and other network providers to sort of have, be able to run the rule over any state special housing area application. Um, there's a problem, I'm sort of using a bit of licence here, there's a problem uh, with WELL coming in and digging up roads right at the moment without it being in collaboration fully with the council, and not, especially not in collaboration with our uh, programmes of works. So would you see that working two ways, that collaboration, or just people being able to ask well, or does well need to, should well, morally, be seeking um, permission and uh, that from other network providers and from council? Um, yes, I, I definitely think it works both ways, but, um, and there are issues that I, I think there are focus groups already that talk about these issues. Um, but for this, for the special housing area policy, um, um, we we will often need to put transformers, <coughs> larger pieces of equipment, not so much cabling within the road reserves. But um, we're getting a lot of you know, where council aren't that keen to do that. So we're we we get to a situation where we need to put a transformer in the road reserve, but we're unable to because. Um, council uh, not so happy with that idea. So, and particularly with, with smaller sites. Um, is this retrofitting? Sorry to interrupt you. Is it retrofitting more something in, existing? Infill. Or greenfield? Infill, yeah. Infill, yeah. Green, greenfields are different because um, usually the developer will set aside areas for transformers, um, specific but, sites. Uh, an SHA infill. area will be greenfields by definition. Yeah. And so wouldn't you... Um, when someone comes in with an application uh, for an SHA to council, wouldn't you guys say, well, given the load we think we need to distribute in that area, this is approximately where we put and work out something with the developer at that point, without, you know, in the greenfield situation? It, you, yes. Well, I'm not sure why it would be a problem in a greenfield. Yes, no, it's definitely no issue. But we, we're more worried about infill um, within the city. Yeah, but that's not the green, this is special housing area um, oh, yeah. policy here that we're dealing with, which is only greenfields. Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, sorry. Our understanding of it was that it could 
development could go. Well, it could go anywhere, anywhere in the city, but, yeah. but 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 not where they're not going to bowl things to put it up. I mean, there's sorts of places that have been. Sorry, I'm. Uh, it's really getting into discussion there. I'm just not <laughs> sure why Wells so concerned because it's not going to existing housing or com or com built built up housing or commercial areas. Okay, no, sorry. Our understanding of it was that um, there there was an infill aspect to it, so hence why we were concerned with the infrastructure. I guess, Madam Chair, if we can put that on a list for later, because it certainly makes sense to make sure that Well has a place for its infrastructure in any SHA area, for sure. Yeah. But yeah. I, I don't think it's going to be one that's going to be a problem. Mm. No. OK. Uh, Just a point of clarification on that. I think an SHA... Could occur in a, um, uh, in a, in a infill situation where there was a sizable, well, well, there was a reasonably sizable piece of land that might have been, you know, a parks and yeah, reserve yeah, or yeah. something like that, yeah. where there might be a degree of retrofitting required yeah. just to house that, the extra electricity or extra services that were required for yeah. that. So right. maybe perhaps if we could just refer that back to the staff just to yep, get clarification. Well, getting a nod over there. But that yep. can go into the uh, land that the, yes. uh, the SHA buildings are going into. Yep. Like it here, yeah, like yeah, could it, it could, yeah, it could do, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm. I can, sorry, I can't, I can't hear you, and or, or maybe it's the accent. Sorry. <laughs> well, they, they can occur in both green mm -hmm. and infill areas. Yep. What? Yeah. What's your definition of infill then? I mean, my, well, okay, the, take this example. This is an existing, uh, the one okay. that was given to us before, around Gilbass, it's an existing residential area. It's in the, yeah. yeah, so this yeah. is what, exactly what I mean. Okay. That's not, that's okay. not ac that is actually Greenfield. I don't, I, I'm not speaking yeah. planner speak here, I'm speaking normal English, and uh, it's, it, it's Greenfield. Okay. Uh, though so, okay. Some, okay. Of, it, some yeah. of it's actually brown, but it's actually Greenfield, mm -hmm. there's no, well, it oh, is. In normal English, it okay. is. So this is the problem with dealing with planners. Yeah. Um, but could I just, could I just we'll, continue? We'll hold that for the list, but yeah. um, I'll just make sure Councillor McPherson has finished his questions. Yeah, I, I'm talking about areas where yes. there are no buildings on yep. them at the moment. Yep. Yeah. Okay. But could I just direct that then to Sarah, that, you know, could, the, could some retrofitting be required, uh, even if it is a, a Gilbass Avenue type, given that it might be preferable for you to have to have the uh, the services, the supply of the services in an already an existing area. You know, it may be just appropriate in terms of a cost of cost uh, a cost analysis to upgrade an existing um, transformer or whatever you use to bring the power in that might require a retrofit, say in. In, 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 in the existing uh, housing area in order to feed that infill or, or as Councillor McPherson refers to, what he regards as a greenfield site? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's quite a technical question, but um, I think that the, depending on, for this, this area, for example, I think the infrastructure might be quite old and might need um, significant upgrades. Um, so it, it could be that that it would need um, not just within the vicinity of the um, of where the surrounding sites yeah, might need yeah, to be upgraded yeah. as well to, okay. to cope oh, with so. that. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. So so in effect, your challenges are can be as you've outlined in your yeah. submission. Um, thank you. There's a follow-on effect, yeah. I yeah. guess. Yeah. Thank you. All right, great. Um, thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for your submission. Okay, our last submitter is driving back from Matter Matter, so my <laughs> device has told me now. Skype her in. Uh, so she's hoping to be here at 3.15 or 3.30. She's oh. up for 3.20, so um, we'll, we'll take a break until... And that's Anna Casey Cox, so we'll take a break until she arrives. Thank you. She'll be on a bike, won't she? Yeah, it'll take a while. <laughs> or a skateboard, perhaps. <laughs>
You had a good drive from, from out of town. All right, your last step. Um, committee members will get going again. Uh, last submission for the day is submission number 17. And that's um, familiar faces at the table. So um, you've got 10 minutes. So we're in your hands. Atua nui e nga huakato, he mahi nui ki nga mana whinua o tēnei rohi, nga te wairiri, he mahi nui ki te rangatira o tēnei rohi kingi tu heitia. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I just wanted to begin with an acknowledgement of mana in and the rangatira of this area of Tainui Waka. A lack of housing in Hamilton affects our most vulnerable communities and um, I just wanted to acknowledge that people have been, uh, you know, systematically uh, made vulnerable and um, we need to remember that when we're talking about um, our approaches to uh, improving the situation of housing in our community. I was at a community Waikato conference yesterday and Dr Hirini Ka uh, talked there about the values of uh, manaakitanga and he talked about radical generosity and the idea that that's really important to um, to, to let that value guide us in terms of the kind of society we want to, to create. So um, that community Waikato conference is going on at the moment, so there'll be lots of, and there was lots of talk yesterday about the importance of today at council and the importance of, um, you know, an approach to housing in our, in our city which is comprehensive, and I know Lindsay talked earlier um, today, so I just want to... Um, Totoko what he said in support of um, looking at what Wellington has achieved in terms of the Mayor's Task Force down there and how they've approached housing uh, very comprehensively. So this uh, house, special housing area is only kind of one aspect, I guess, or one part of the picture, uh, and it would be really neat to see something uh, more comprehensive done like uh, Wellington has been able to achieve. Um, in terms of poverty action and our perspective, I mean, we've always campaigned against the sale of state housing, against the sale of publicly owned housing, because we, we really believe that um, over the last 30 years, in particular in New Zealand, uh, with the neoliberal approach to uh, just about everything, um, 
th there has been this dominant idea of, of markets will save us and markets will achieve everything that we, we need to achieve. And we, we just don't see that playing out. We know that inequality is huge in New Zealand now, uh, and we know that um, it's actually the number one election issue, so people are really concerned about it. And that, that, that way of um, operating, that ideology of neoliberalism has actually led us down a lot. So th that's been our perspective uh, for a long time and we will continue to hold it really and um, value publicly owned uh, state housing. And in terms of that and the pensioner housing uh, that was sell sold off um, by Hamilton City Council, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was a promise that that money would be reinvested uh, into housing or at least into social, social issues, but I thought it was housing and we haven't seen that. So I'd really like to encourage council to think about that money that was uh, derived from the sale of pension housing and um, to reinvest that into emergency and temporary accommodation in our city. Um, I want to highlight a story from the Waikato Women's Ref Refuge that was shared with us recently. Um, over the past three months, I've had about 68 women come into their services, I understand, and 28 of them have been forced to go back to uh, the violent relationships that they fled. Now, that's because of a lack of affordable housing in Hamilton, because of a lack of options, and, and that, that is a hugely concerning uh, reflection, I think, from them. Um, in terms of the special housing area policy, I guess in terms of this and it going ahead, the rules need to be solid and they need to um, be set to achieve the goal of affordable housing. So from our perspective, it's really important that the private developers involved in this work are required to work with the social housing providers and social service sector, because it's that sector that understands the needs of the community. And, um, and I just think that you've got that in your policy as an idea, and I think it's really important that that's um, followed through on. And in terms of, uh, I guess, Housing affordability needs to be considered uh, holistically, and we draw on the work of uh, Professor Philippa Howden Chapman in suggesting that because she talks about looking at you know how houses are built, are built because ultimately a more environmentally friendly house is going to be more uh, affordable in the long term because the costs of heating it are less. A, ho a house that's next to or accessible to public transport is more affordable because transport is a huge issue for our poorer communities. Um, and then the other aspect of the social housing uh, or, the, or the policy that you've put forward, the draft policy, is that um, you know there's a, there's a sentence in there about possibly creating a legal um, way of ensuring that the houses are retained as affordable housing, but there's no real um, description of what that might look like. And I think that legal mechanism is probably really important because I can't understand how the affordable housing is going to be retained without it. And Philippa Howden Chapman talks about uh, the experience of Waimahia in South Auckland. And that is a housing project which involved a government grant and affordable new housing was built by a consortium. The first stage of those houses was sold on the open market, but she says that they already have been resold at a greater price than the prices set by the consortium. So it's how, how is that affordable housing that is, that is potentially part of these special housing areas, how is that going to be retained without some kind of rule or mechanism to protect it? So just really want to encourage the council, we don't have any of those legal expertise, but encourage the council to think about what that mechanism could be so that that's protected uh, going forward. And we certainly also request that the council um, develops a monitoring mechanism so that the community is informed about how well this, this approach is working. Like, you know, if it's a direction that the council is going to take in terms of creating these housing areas, uh, we need to know it's working. We need to know that it's actually meeting the needs of our community because as um, the Women's Refuge has reflected and uh, as we know by our homelessness stats and such, there are lots of, um, you know, it's, re it's really, really important that we achieve affordable housing in our community. So um, that's it from us, I think, unless you've got anything. Okay, Thank great. you. Thanks, Anna. We'll yep. go to questions. Councillor Pascoe. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Anna. Thanks, Rose. Yeah. present today. Um, do you have any suggestions on how we can get developers to work 
with council and the social housing providers. Um, you know, I, I, when I say this, I say this in line with, you know, we have, we have got some developers in the city like Andrew Yeoman and John Weir about at Rukura who are building sort of higher density, lower cost, lower cost houses. Um, how, how, do, how, do we, how do we enhance that? And do you think that the likes of what Andrew and John are building are in fact meeting um, people seeking to get into homes that are at a much lower than the prices that appear to be falling out of Rototuna and so forth at the moment. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think there's a, a kind of a, um, a disconnect between these two worlds. I don't know the developers in Hamilton, and I don't think the social service sector does either. So in terms of asking us how we work with them, we don't know who they are. So that's not, you know, we don't really have any good suggestions around that, apart from that this policy um, and your, your line in there about that requirement is something that they would have to adhere to when they're, when they're undertaking a special housing area development? Or, uh, well, I, I, get, I guess they could at the outset, and I don't want to get into a discussion on this, but yeah. they could. Um, the, the, the next step, of course, becomes when those people buy those houses, we've got no control over what they then sell them for. Mm. Well, um, so, and, and in terms of that, that is the issue, isn't it? Like, otherwise, yeah. what is this? I mean, I mean yeah. then we fall back onto the state saying, you know, should they be state what we used to know as state houses, yeah. mm. where central government then continue the ownership yeah. and therefore continue to have some mm. ability to control the people I mean, who go into that those 20 houses. I mean, that 20% of the houses that you've, you've suggested might be affordable in that development could be owned collectively, they could be owned by the state, they could be owned by a social housing provider, and, yep. and that's the way of doing it. Council. They could be owned by council. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there are... Um, do I turn this Just on? Push oh, yeah. There are some issues with, with high density housing and families living in them, such as um, access for children and safety when cars and people all mm. have to use the same driveway. And, um, you know, some of those issues that I think um, can compromise the health and well being or the, the sort of physical activity. Um, aspect of accessibility to to those housing areas when they become quite dense. So yeah, I think yeah. it's... Um, so one, 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 one tick often follows with a cross somewhere, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's yeah. like working out that balance between um, accessibility and <coughs> um, easy access, all of those things with um, the needs of the, you know, the... the everyday needs of the people who live there and how we manage that while at the same time valuing that you know, or realising that we no longer live in a quarter acre whatever paradise, Pavlova paradise actually and, um, and we don't want to constantly be creeping into the, you know, the horticultural, ag agricultural environments. So we don't want to constantly expand, I don't think, the city mm. boundaries. We need to use what we have within the city well so that we maintain um, full land use to feed the city even, you know, so that we're not having to then look at transporting our food for hundreds of kilometres to, you know, so there's all sorts of balances. So, yeah, I don't know whether that answers your do question. You do you think, though, given that the, the central government's asked councils to set up special housing areas, is a little bit of a cop-out by central government to say, well, we don't want to be responsible for it. We think it should be channeled down through the um, to the councils and, and leave them to sort it out with their communities rather than... The, the central government model, which of course in the 50s, yeah, 1950s I mean, I, and 60s was yeah. around state housing, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, our perspective is that the, the government at the moment has completely copped out on, on housing, because that's why we're facing what we've, what we've got at the moment. So, um, as I said before, and, and we always have advocated for state housing, we think publicly owned housing is absolutely imperative to the wellbeing of our, of our nation, really. So. Um, yeah, they, they have copped out on housing. The special out housing areas, I mean, very cynically, we just think it's um, potentially a developer's dream. Um, but, you know, council in, in this policy, at least you're considering 
uh, how best to take it forward and the ways, the mechanisms that are available to you to ensure that, that, that if this does happen, that it has the, the best potential possible to actually deliver affordable housing. And, that, and, and that's why I'm, I'm interested in this idea of a legal mechanism that does protect though that, that percentage of housing that, that will be so-called affordable. I mean, there's a lot of things that aren't defined. You know, what, what is affordable um, from the council's yeah. perspective? What is, what is a social housing provider? What, well, they're, they're registered, but um, <coughs> yeah, there's a few things in there that just could do with a bit more thought as to what, what you actually mean um, when you say affordable. Okay. And there's a degree of irony in um, setting up a special housing area when in actual fact a few years ago we understood the pressure to sell the housing that Hamilton City owned had come through from central government. So on the one hand they're saying sell your publicly owned assets and on the other hand, they're saying now you provide special mm. housing areas. And I know it's too late. And around this table, you collectively decided to make that decision to sell against our better judgment. But, um, <laughs> and, you know, it just, it just defies, it kind of beggars belief. Okay. That okay, this, this yeah. situation okay, has we'll, arisen. We'll just keep to questions and answers because um, Councillor Henry, you're next. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, and then, Rose, um, look, I just have a question. Talking again about affordable housing, um, have you seen what the Runanga has done with their housing? Mm. I mean, they, from what I understand, I only know a little bit, but from what I understand that they also have some clauses in there that they're not allowed to sell it for mm. so many years, and if they sell it, they have to sell it back to the Runanga mm. and things like that. Would that be something that you think would be a, a really good model as well to have as part of um, yeah, that, so that special housing? Yeah, they've set that up in their own development, their own rules to, yeah. yeah. So I, I guess, and that was the experience that I think um, that Philippa Howden Chapman was reflecting that happened in South Auckland. My understanding now is that that, that group does not sell any of their housing to property developers, because what <coughs> I think that's what happened. It, 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 yeah. um, they got bought and sold on by property developers. So right. I guess there's some things you can put in place um, but, but the special housing area itself isn't um, it isn't managed by the developers. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, yeah, who's who's managing them as such. The mm -hmm. so Runanga is managing that yes. development. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. But a special housing area isn't. It's not necessarily one developer that's managing mm. it. I don't know. These are the things I guess that mm. okay. this policy is. Yep. Partly to determine, yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank right, you. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Uh, just three que quick questions from me. We, I'm racking my brain because I usually don't forget these things, but um, you, your organisation was part of a housing strategy. Yes. Uh, that, if I'm recalling right, was we were a partner to, and that strategy was supposed to be developed. I believe um, the Deputy Mayor was on the group with the former mayor. I don't think that plan ever came to no, us, no, did it, no, Anna? it didn't come to us either. I was right, okay, <laughs> all right. I, I, yeah. I'm going to follow that up offline if That'd I can, because I know can, yeah. um, there are a couple of other members interested in that. Cool, um, that You mentioned, uh, or as you know, we're a very late comer to the housing accord, um, and you mentioned in your written submission that um, it's unknown to you whether Auckland actually delivered affordable housing. Are there in, and I've also tried to look for that information myself, are there any uh, cities that signed up to the Accord that are several years, years in advance of us that actually did deliver affordable housing that you know of? Sorry, no, I don't know. No. I, I mean, okay. I, I know Auckland doesn't, say, it doesn't appear to have um, it been effective up there, but uh, I think there's a report coming out soon, possibly, on that. I think I read that somewhere okay. on the Auckland's Accord. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you'd be aware of the government's measure of multiplying the household income um, by 6.8, which in Hamilton works out at uh, um, a house price of 469000 In your experience and the people that you work with, oh. is that affordable? No. So what price, what price <laughs> bracket, I know that's a bit of a, 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 a general question, but what price bracket would be affordable, do you think? I know that's a tough question to, it's a Well, I would question. think you'd be looking at um, 
somewhere between two and three and a half hundred thousand rather than four to five hundred thousand mm. to be honest um if you're i mean wages Yes, have I certainly all the not increased in any yeah. way that would no. mean that okay. um, even on a um, even on a living wage you would barely afford um, yeah. to be having a paying off yes. a mortgage on a do, three to four hundred thousand yeah. dollar home. Do you <clears throat> would it would it be information that you would be able to? It would certainly help um, me. If, if in, in the work that you do out in the community that you could do a little bit of work, um, might be anecdotal, to actually come up with what you think would be affordable, you know, people actually on the ground? Is that and something this is, you this could is do? Um, purchasing a house, this yes. is not rent yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Is that okay. something that you, you feel you'd be in the position to help us with at some point? It actually could be both avenues, Yeah. There are Ex ideas of trusts that can be set up and then rent, yeah. or rent to buy. Mm. There's some mm. sort of options like yeah. that. And Is yeah. that something you well, can help yeah, I mean, I think, um, advise on? The Salvation Army, I would recommend too, in terms of that work. Okay. Like, um, we, we draw a lot of our you know, statistical information, I guess, from them. Uh, and Alan Johnson um, would be really, really good on that. Oh. So that that's probably over us. I would recommend mm. someone like okay. that. Okay, I'll I'll, mm. I'll, um, I'll I'll do that then because yeah. I think that that's certainly missing from the conversation. And we are, you know, this comes to us for Coast Council at the twenty fourth of August, and we're needing to make some decisions. Mm. So mm. that would be helpful. Um, Councillor Southgate. Thank you. I'm not sure if mine hasn't been picked up. So <laughs> this one to that and Dave. Dave, um, no, so that's okay. I think what we've got to is I was also going to ask that there is, there are, I mean, building a house for 230 in the is going to be a, quite a challenge in today's market, um, but also providing affordable renting or um, lease to buy or those other kinds of ownership models, um, we need to get our head around that. Yeah. That's wondering whether you've got some yeah. ability to help in that respect. Uh, well, I, like going back to what we said before about the Wellingtons approach, I think actually, and, and Angela, you've mentioned the plan, I, I really think that, that in that process and, and doing it collaboratively with all of the stakeholders involved in this, um, you know, developers included, because we don't know them, so building those relationships between so that we all have a sense of the current picture of housing in, New, in Hamilton, uh, and then we can, you know, figure out from there too with the social service sector who, you know, is broader than us, obviously, what, what you know, the, the realities are out there and what people, actually how people want to be housed. We don't talk about that very much. And the co-housing, I know you've had a number of submissions on that idea. And I think we've got an issue around an ageing population, which is, it is really significant. So we need to have those broader conversations. Yeah. And are you okay. suggesting, um, thank, Sorry. that's fine. Uh, are you suggesting that to undertake that work prior, before, uh, prior to, Finalising the detail of the policy would be the ideal solution, which, which is pretty much what we heard from Lindsay yeah, Humberpatch. That, that makes sense to me. Yeah, and that that sort of um, if the council took the time, that could be done readily, um, quite quickly. That conversation could be had quite quickly. It's not like a year or months in the months in the development. It's a conversation, right? Mm, yeah, is that what you're asking? And, and there's already been some work done. Uh, this Hamilton Housing Plan, I think, was what it was called. Um, so that? it's finding that. Mm. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I'd be very interested in that. I'll chase that one. Mm. It's on the thank list. You. Once it gets on my list, that's it. <laughs> Stays there. <laughs> okay. Look, thank you very much, and thank you um, for rushing over um, from Matter Matter and coming to talk to us cool. today. It was very helpful. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Right. So um, this next part, as we've done in the. P oh, sure. Yes, of course. Oh, yes. It's ten to four. All right. Back in five.
tea. I said I don't think Dave went out for his cup of tea. <coughs> yep. I will be well and yes we'll be well and truly done in uh, 10 minutes. Ma not even that actually five. Okay we'll get we'll get going again. So we're only sort of five minutes away really with a wrap up from for in, from ending. So um, Paul are you you're up at the table now. Um, now, just a reminder, committee, this is not time for debate or su substantive discussion on the issues. Um, we can take questions from, uh, we'll give questions from staff on the analysis report, and then we'll do the round table of a list of things that you want to see back in the deliberations report, and I've captured some of those for you, hopefully, and we have had staff sitting here all day um, doing notes. so whatever our list is for you to bring back, what probably you'll have captured it all. So a reminder, we're not discussing the substantive issue. Um, so our report is on page 11, <coughs> and we'll take it as read. Um, is there uh, any questions um, on the actual report? Possibly not. Oh yes, sorry, some, Councillor Pasco. Yep. Yeah, I've got some questions, and I, I and, and they may. Be, I, I hope they're not comments, but I'd like them to be questions. Make sure they're not. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and and I guess I'm just going to ask whether or not if if I've misread them, or whether the staff could take into account when they prepare the report for the 24th of August. Yeah. Um, so if if they sound like comments, it's not intended, but I'd like to get them clarified in your report for the 20, 24th and. The first is uh, my my reading of the SHAs is that councillor count, sorry council is one of the parties to the SHA in the sense that we will probably become the enabler. So could I just get some clarity in your report that that will be the, that, that if that is not the case, perhaps you could spell it out in the report as to because there was a sense of a, a sense of a comment, sense of a number of comments today not really suggesting where council should go in terms of getting alongside the trusts or the groups who, who wanted to set up housing, but more along the lines of perhaps I got the sense that they thought council should have a much more active role. Yeah. And, and I just would like to get some clarity around the fact that I understood that our major role was the enabler, that we could pick a piece of land such as the Hutchinson's land, which is, which is currently industrial, and if it suits yeah. uh, for an SHA, <coughs> then we could move um, as quickly as we could to get that change from being industrial to residential. So, yes. And, and so our so role in the whole scheme of things yeah. is to become the enabler to get that done so that then Mr and Mrs Hutchinson can then go ahead mm. and do what they need to do in order to get those sections ready for sale um, in terms of their development. So in, in bringing that back the report then, obviously the clarity around our role within that policy, but as well I think also um, Councillor Pascoe is asking for, for uh, and perhaps it sits outside the policy, I mean we could partner at any time with any social housing provider. So just some commentary around that as well, because you're right, a lot of submitters raised that today and possibly expectations of partnerships with council in the future, especially around co-housing and things like that. So policy wouldn't, uh, you'll bring this back, but comment whether the policy would um, actually restrict that as well, but I don't Yeah, and I, and I guess case. I'm looking for making sure that the, <coughs> the, um, the uh, inference in the Shah is that council is not being expected to be, from government, that, mm. that Council is not expected to become a partner in the in the whole development, and if so, then I think we need to be quite clear as to you know as to where that might start and yep. start and finish. Yep. And and the only other the only other question I've got is, um, you know, I thought the uh, Mr. Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Hutchinson's <coughs> submission was very very good. It had a lot of detail in it, a lot of questions, and so I'd, I'd really like some um, analysis of that. 
in to, not, not line by line, but perhaps uh, addressing some of the issues that they have raised in their submission that will flow through to that report on the 24th. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, Oh, while we're waiting for others to give a list, um, I've captured a couple of things that I'd like answered within that deliberations report. Um, Thomas Gibbons raised through the Property Council his submission his concerns around how uh, we will manage urban design. So I just need to understand, I mean, his, the Property Council submission was saying we don't really want it in there, um, but I'd like to understand how how we will actually manage it. We don't have an urban design panel anymore. Um, you know, is that going to be subjectively uh, evaluated by staff, et cetera? So I'd like that information to come back. Yeah, sure. Um, the uh, Fonterra submission, um, I'd like to understand a little bit, little bit of commentary around... Um, could hang on, big change from the digital around the impact of, because I mean, they, they, were, they were talking about the impacts that their activity would have on uh, surrounding industrial land that may be converted to a special housing area. So just kind of like to understand uh, the actual risk of a development and, and how many developments or potential industrial land around them could be converted, if that's possible. Um, Dave, do you want to pick up the electricity Concern. I've noted it down here, but um, my concern with the well um, submission was that they want us to give them the right to veto, literally, or to demand access right across the city anywhere. And I have no problems with them doing that in what I call a green fields area, i.e., an area where there's green fields and no houses or commercial buildings. Um, because, you know, and the example on the map that I gave them was the same example that, who bought it from Gilbass Avenue yeah. area? Uh, whoever yeah, bought Tony that. McLaughlin. Yeah, that's Tony McLaughlin's example, which mm. is quite good because Foster's, yeah. that, that's, yep. uh, if that causes an expansion of need in the, yeah. um, of uh, load need, as far as electricity goes, then I would see them, us saying, yep, go for it, work out a place within that oblong of, of grass to before you put up the houses where, where your in, little bit of infrastructure mm. can go rather than no we're going to have it down the road on um, you know Rivington Ave or somewhere nearby and we're going to demand yep. this corner or that bit of road reserve for it um, and that's I don't, I don't think we should have anything in our policy that says anything about yep. areas that they're not actually putting the SHA houses mm. into Okay, so is that that's clear what information we'd like back on that one? Yep. Yep, we great. Um, I'll that. just continue with my list. Um, I'd like to understand uh, our reasons for, I oh know, who was it? Foster um, Develop raised um, the issue of us having, uh, they want to be able to come to us at any time with an application for a, a, a development. I'd like to understand why we are um, proposing in the policy, maybe it might be a couple of times a year, I, I guess I'm assuming that's going to be a resource thing, but I'd like to understand the reasons why and actually how on the ground you think it is going to run in the building. Um, that could be a very important one, I'd like to add to that, that we yep. in fact almost put it in a way is why could there not be a continuously running policy yes. like there is for other app, for building yep. applications or subdivision applications. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that was all that I captured. Uh, um, no, oh, no, all, no. Also a little bit more, no, uh, a little bit of comment, well actually quite a bit of comment on actu actually how or if our policy does actually allow for co-housing in a special housing area. I, I'm kind of a top of my head assuming it does, but just like some, some comment around that because that was raised by uh, certainly the morning's uh, submitters. So I think that's all that I had on my uh, list. So, um, Councillor Henry, you had some stuff on your list or questions of the analysis report? Yeah, yeah, I, I have got. Um, well, the Perry Foundation said, um, why can't we do things better, uh, quicker? So it's just a question of 
yeah, why can't we do things quicker? Especially, we have urgency now. It is about urgency in a way, isn't it? That's how I yeah. hear all the so time. You, That's so what you is, yeah. want, you're wanting to understand from the deliberations yeah. report, perhaps even an example of, of yeah. how it would work and how, how quickly yeah. we yeah. could move I mean, the Hushar Act, the whole purpose is to fast track. It, it is, yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. it is, it is. So and perhaps, yeah, just, a, just an example of... Time say, frames. Yeah, time frames. Yes, yeah. that would yeah. be great yeah. to understand yeah. that, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, he showed in that in the diagram the you know, the, fa uh, the slow track with the red and then the green one, the faster track, so. Uh, sure. You asked a question, you said the purpose of the Act was fast tracking. Can you actually read us what the purpose of the Act is out of the Act, please? Well, well that's not what I read the Act. So, so yeah, was. but no, um, look, this is, this is, we need to do the round table list. We can't get into substantive discussion. We haven't publicly notified the meeting of that. Uh, sorry, the public of that, that that's what this meeting is about. No, so it's a misunderstanding. We, this group here should all have an, an, a copy of the Act in front of us right now. I mean, it's serious yeah, well, that th we're... That, that's up to each member, though, with respect to me, Andrew, to, to either have or have not at this point in hang time. Hang on, hang on. This, we're sitting here today... Yes, I, I know why we're ...talking about the Act, and none of us, not one person in this room, has got a copy of the um, Act in no, front no, of No, no, no. Sorry, me, Andrew. Actually, I do on my laptop, and I'm very familiar with the Act. So, again, we cannot get into discussion or deliberations today. This my, is my about... My concern is, is that the staff member just quoted the purpose of the Act. He hasn't got a copy of the Act in front of him, right, and that's so, not what the so, Act says. So, so that's not accurate information, that's what I'm saying. I, I was just responding to Councillor Henry's question that does the Act allow faster track consideration and of, of the Act. And, and, and I said it does. And it's not the purpose of the Act. The purpose okay, of the Act, so, it doesn't talk about that. I was responding to Councillor yeah. Henry's question. So let's carry on with Councillor Henry. So do you have anything else for the list? Yeah, just one more thing is about um, uh, why, well, uh, there was another question, why do we reinvent the wheel? So can we compare some of the things we're doing here with Tauranga so we don't have to do double up um, that what they've already sure. done ahead of us? So if there's some things that we could so do better. So you're wanting better. some comparisons yeah. in the policy? Yeah. Uh, for comparing our policy, just yeah. some key points? Sure. Yeah, just some I mean, points, yeah. Just, just for, we've been speaking with Taronga for the last six months. Okay. And okay. Uh, comparing what they do and speaking to the officers there. So. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Okay. okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. That's Is all. Is that all, That's Councillor? It. Thank That's you, it. Councillor. Yeah. Um, Councillor Southgate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of things. Firstly, around the questions raised around uh, zones that had other than residential status in the district plan, um, the business zone, sex, um, uh, industrial land and so on. Um, is there any information that could be brought to us, not today, but of course, um, around the yield we could get from unlocking some of those areas? No, maybe not all, but is there, a, you know, what is the potential sitting in those areas that are currently not... Um, easily um, identified in the plan. Uh, secondly, um, that, that's the same thing about the, the bias towards um, zones already zoned residential. But how are we, um, I just want to, this is a very broad scale thing, because these are in no particular order, as just as I've wrote the notes, so excuse me, they're a bit sure. over the place. How we are able to be both on the one hand permissive while ensuring some base level outcomes that the Act calls for. I'd, I'd like to really be able to see how that's being achieved on both scores when we come to have a conversation about it. Um, I'd like to understand more about the halo effect from Auckland versus the need for local locals to access the housing market, what that would be look, look like, and what the potential solutions would be would be, because I'd like to think the special housing areas do more than uh, accommodate Auckland's overflow, but they actually provide sort of long-term living arrangements for people in this area, some of those that are locked out presently. Um, secondly, or thirdly, I should say, um, there was lots of comment around uh, stepping back for a second and having conversation with the likes of MSD and community housing and sectors and some of the Philanthropics are involved in other types of housing provision. Have we got time for um, a 
you know, I understand the urgency of this and I don't want to hold it up for six months. Have we got time to get some um, targeted feedback from those sectors? And then the last one, oh, second one, yep, um, two more. How we incorporate uh, the best practice aspects of other areas that have already started down this track and um, or are doing housing under different models, including the Wellington one that we saw, which was a very well sent out document to read. It was nice and easy. Um, Christchurch, some of the Auckland developments, uh, how we could um, build off what works and avoid what doesn't, because quite clearly some of the um, housing areas in Auckland haven't been as successful as, as they may have wished or as pleasant as they might have wished for in the end as well. And last one, um, oh, yes, just in terms of, two more, sorry. How we uh, define affordable, having some better understanding, because I think some of the submitters raised a good point around the definition of affordable. I'm sitting here with an understanding of what I believe affordability means, and I imagine if we went around all of our members, there'd be differences within that, and so I'd like to kind of work from a base of a definition that we, are, you know, and the last thing is the social housing money was referred to, and it's, it's before my time, and I, I don't want to go over history, but if there is some money that came in from social housing in the second lot that just recently came in or was coming in, where did this go? What was the purpose of the money? How could it be used to assist us in developing um, these networks? And I think that's along the same lines as the question you've got, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, because I don't really know enough about it, so 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 put me in the picture there, please. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Southat, can I just check the... Uh, you said something about targeted feedback from social agencies. Mm. Are you wanting something that's more that that's more from their submission points? Um, or no, do you... I think they made it quite clear. A couple of submitters today, three, I think, made it quite clear that they would like us... One went as far as saying to step back work in tandem with these people, have you know, have an approach similar to Wellington. I, I'm um, of the mind that the, so, there is some urgency about this. Yeah. I don't want to slow it up too much, but is there a touchstone point in, in, in between where we can get a steer from those agencies? A steer for what? For a, st a steer for policy answering or? the... Pardon? A steer for the policy. For the policy. It's got to be policy specific. But it's in terms of how it meets that overall um, suite of housing need for the, for the community. They had some ideas about the range and type of housing that needs to be provided. And they hold some data that some, other than just plain economic data and housing trends, they, are, they hold some social data and other things. You referred is, to it, Angela. Is that clear? Because yeah. yeah. I'm clear. Um, I mean, can, so, okay. can I just be clear? The, uh, and it's the narrow form document from Wellington. We just have to be very careful. Um, we're confined by what we can do under the Hasher Act yes. and what we've signed under the Housing Accord. On and the report, was certainly, it? a mayor reform on housing or a separate housing strategy okay. is where you probably explore some of those social uh, issues that but, have but come you out. But you can put that commentary in the yeah. report. Yeah, and, and yeah, the, yeah, I'm, sure. not, I'm not suggesting we can we have do the discussion that. at that time. Sure. Yeah, okay. Great. And, and what Thank I was you. leading to, Madam Chair, you said you didn't quite understand it, is you remember call asking Anna yourself and a number of those social providers, and they mentioned that. Um, Salvation Army? Was it Salvation Army? Yes, it was. So, yeah. so that kind of thing will help me too in the same way okay. that I think you expressed it would help you. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, Councillor Taylor? Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Madam Chair. A number of mine have been mentioned already. I, I just want to emphasise uh, for me um, my understanding of the special housing areas was that it was going to help us fast track new housing. And I, I'm just getting the sense that we seem to be cluttering up, cluttering things up with complexities a bit, and I'm worried that it's not going to be the the, the speedy sort of model that that uh, we were talking about at the start. I'm sure that when Nick Smith came here in December, he was talking about um, creating housing areas not just from residential but from non-residential, from industrial areas and commercial. And I'm a little worried that um, we're possibly going to make it too hard for people, or we are making it too complicated for people who aren't in residential areas. And I think we need to find a way of, of uh, if, the, if there is assessment that needs to be done, and I'm sure there is, it needs, needs to be really quickly done, and some very quick 
way that that can be handled. So, so, ra so that sounds like debate. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm so just in saying in terms of that's information the question that you in want my back. mind. Um, what impediments are we okay. putting up? Yep. Um, and, and in my view, they need to be sorted out. Um, okay. yep. the, secondly, what other um, what other complexities are we adding to this? Uh, a number of um, submitters talked about wanting the ability to come to us as and when required. I've had a, Paul and I talked a little bit about that. Um, so I'm thinking, how can we ensure that we're open to them and that we can we can move on their time frame? I'm concerned that we may have other limitations in the plan, such as um, I think there was a minimum need for 10 houses. I'm not sure um, why that needs to be there. There may be, there's probably a, a good reason, but I just need to be reminded about that. Is it necessary? Um, I am beginning to have some doubts about our um, us putting in that 20% um, uh, criteria for uh, smaller houses, 20%. I'm beginning to wonder if, if that's the wrong lever to achieve that, and I'm just wondering. I'm really, I'm thinking it's not going to achieve it myself. With this, this right, I don't, don't want to lapse into debate. But to me, and it may, it's maybe a more political thing than something you guys can can talk more about. So that's those are my concerns that's your list. there. Yep, great. Uh, is there anything else? No, I mean the social. I am interested in the social area as well in terms of partnerships, very strong theme coming through there and uh, I'd like to investigate how we go about doing that but that's covering old ground. Uh, but for me it's a speed, how can we make this a quick, you know, a quick fix thing so that we've got people who are out of residential areas and that they can just get on with it. That's a big thing Thanks Councillor Taylor. I just wonder, just following on from um, that if we can also have uh, and uh, some information on the number of social housing complexes um, in the city at a point in time. I know we've we've certainly done many reports with numbers, so that hopefully should be an easy grab from some document somewhere, because um, that might help set a bit of a framework and context for our policy setting as well. Uh, Me, Andrew. I want to ask the question, you know, I want you to come back to ask why we even need a policy. Um, I'm, and that's where we're trying to get innovative thinking and as soon as you have a policy you start re restricting the innovative thinking so I just want you to come back and answer that question. <coughs> I also want um, this table, oh, I, I'd also like to know that this table, that elected members are gonna make the, are gonna see every single offer, and they're at this table here, elected members are gonna assess every offer, everyone who applies, and this table will make the decision on whether to go further or not with, I, I, I'm asking that your report covers off staff discounting and sidelining offers and innovative ideas that come through before this table gets a chance to actually look at them and decide whether this table of elected members think it's on or not. So we don't want screening pre this table looking at them. Um, I just want you to answer those questions when you come back. Yeah, sure. So why there's a policy and who's gonna actually do the assessment yeah. and, and where elected members fit into that process. It's in the policy, so, so but staff, it's not, but staff it's not. look at proposals and recommend them to this council for yeah. consideration. So it'd be good to understand actually how governance fits in though, and whether there's any, I think with Mayor Andrews going, whether there's any suggestion of filtering uh, prior to that. So it's, and it's also understanding actually the timeline as well. It's sure. all of that. Um, this is. If we go ahead with it, okay. Well, no, Angela, it's not what I was asking. The, the policy yep. is setting out a very different process than what the Act sets out. I'm asking you to go back to the Act, okay? Oh, I'll All have right. to disagree with you there. 
Well, yeah. it's and not really your place to disagree. No. You, I'm, you I'm just informing you well, of I, I, no, the policy. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Madam Chair, point of order. Yeah. I do not think a staff member should be starting an argument with the with this, the the yeah. mayor or any other elected member if they've asked for something to go on the list that's yeah. it and they well, don't have to and, and okay. I will I will um, come back yeah. and outline understand, the process understand yeah. um, the time to answer the questions is is in the deliberations report thank Certainly. you yeah so um, what what anything else on there, Mayor Andrew no that's oh thank great you. okay all right so that's a bit of a list oh sorry around the table oh I was just going on oh sorry there you are. Councilman I thought McPherson. you were doing nicely round the table. <laughs> no, no, I'm just going on this, but I see you there. You just want there. to miss out the three old men. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and Martin. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> OK, hey, look, firstly, agree with all of Jeff's points. And on the process timeline, mm. I, I do think there's a cluttering up that appears to be happening, and I'd like to understand that, whether we have to be that prescriptive about the process, which seems to be the case. I'd like to see a deadline put on um, the processing, and I think 20 working days would is a good start pitch, but I don't know what the pro... You know, there may be some technical things that make it difficult. I'd like to know them. Um, I, I mean, we had a submitter say to us they want to start their thing in October, and while we, we shouldn't be deciding in, in the policy whether they can start in October or not, I think we should yeah. be able to give them a decision that says yes or no yeah. by then. Mm -hmm. um, so whether our process can do that. Um, we've had the discussion about the elected members. With Fonterra, I'd like to understand from a current district plan situation what their buffers are around there that are part of the district plan and if there are any other legal buffers. Like, I know there's a noise one, but I don't know about any others. And um, because I think that may be important when it comes down to decision-making with that particular area, since we may have competing things happening up there. Um, the And I note, I want it future proof looked at there because it says while these are the indicative industrial areas and district plans have got them more than indicative. As far as future proof goes, they can be swapped for other ones within the vicinity. Yeah. And you know, whether we're go whether it's forcing us to be hard and ability to look at something like Perry's and say, well, if we're getting industrial other industrial land over there, that's not that itself is not an argument against this one becoming an SHA. So I'd like some information around that. Um, the 20% um, thing, I share some doubts about whether that is best applied to every individual application. I certainly support that outcome, but does it have to be within every single individual SHA? Could it not be that over a year we expect to have so many hundred SHA mm. ha units approved and 20% of them will be, because it may be in one area, take around Gallagher's land down there, you may get a lot of there, or it may be because a trust is set, setting up to run it, sure. the whole thing is a, the, yeah. yeah, yeah, so, mm -hmm. and then you don't have to worry about two of the others having none within it. So I want to know whether we could have that way of looking at the 20% or whatever percentage we come up with. And yeah, that was it, thanks. That was on your list. Um, okay, so anyone else got anything on the list? couple more things. Um, I just need you to cover off that the Act takes precedence and the po or the policy, whichever we decide to go with, over the RPS and the, and the district plan, and that it's laid out very clearly, because that's the purpose of, one of the purposes of the Act in the first place. Just that one, Andrew? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, Councillor Tooman? Yeah, probably won't go to Pardon me. Probably won't go to Good Town by the 24th. But a couple of submitters there was uh, Nick Green from Habitat and uh, Lindsay Cumberpatch from DV Bryant Trust. Uh, they were both fairly enthusiastic about getting um, developers and council and everybody else sort of talking to each other so they didn't actually get some progress in a united sort of approach. So you want some... Um, so if we could sort of just make a note that uh, it's not going to happen before the 24th, I realise that. But uh, there's probably a lot of good ideas out there. The other one is um, 
with Fonterra, I thought it was a little bit sort of a, a selfish sort of attitude which they had uh, with their 250 metre clear zone, I think it is what I, well, Dave's already, already mentioned it. But they were just about taking the um, Perry development, I'd say. So um, I think we need to probably have a look at that part. It's quite obvious that that one I think that was yeah. Councillor Tooman, I think that's captured in a couple of other elected yeah. members' yeah. lists. So, yeah, yeah good yeah. point. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, uh, uh, Mayor Andrew again. <coughs> can we mitigate the... Can you report back on how we can mitigate the risk by putting something on the title or saying that anything that goes in that area has to have triple glazing um, for noise and that type of thing, if you can bring back some advice around those matters, um, um, other ways of, of um, uh, getting around it where the um, people who are building inside that mm. zone that Fonterra want protected, is there another way that we can um, tag the property titles and also go further than what our rules would normally say with double glazing and go to triple glazing um, mm. or, or something like that on everything that gets built in that, in that area that Fonterra is talking about. So you can just report back on that. And the other thing, just to clarify further on what Jeff Taylor was asking, um, just to ensure that, um, well, that hopefully I'm on the same wavelength as Jeff is, um, that you remove the, or you look at removing the zoning hierarchy from the policy so that a piece of industrial land will be considered at the same level as, say, oh, a right, piece of residential yeah. land that wants to go up to high density residential. And that's even, I mean, I'm never going to agree with this, but that there's no, nothing prohibited. So even a park could be considered. So that there's no, nothing, there's no hierarchy whatsoever in, in the policy. So that it's up to whoever's assessing to assess on the merits of what's being offered rather than the zoning, the existing zoning of the land. Yep, certainly. I mean, the yeah. Schedule 3 sets out those exceptions. So yeah, those, the, yeah. the business and the residential and industrial is all for consideration. Yeah, okay, so, yep. Um, is that all, Mayor Andrew, for your list? Yep, thank yep. you. And that's everyone, I think. All right, thank you. Look, that was a long day, but I think it was um, it was really helpful, and I appreciate everybody um, everybody's time. Oh, we need to uh, accept the report on page eleven. I've just thanks, um, Councillor Pascoe. I've just added a B, which is um, we should yeah. always have on these that the deliberation report being cons be considered yeah, at the twenty fourth August twenty seventeen council meeting. Oh, it is up there. Oh, great. So I've asked actually for that that. Uh, to be on all of the reports, not just that we receive them. So that's being moved by Councillor Tooman. Uh, sorry, Councillor Pascoe, seconded by Councillor Tooman. Uh, any debate? All those in favour? Are there any against? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.